Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good morning, this is Jonathan Small, host of All About You. This program is broadcast every week at AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. This show is designed to give the guests a chance to give their life story. And this morning, I have a guest that's in the entertainment business. He is a nominated Grammy record producer. His name is Chris Big Dog Davis. Good morning, Chris. How you doing? Good morning, Jonathan. How are you? I'm doing fine to you. I'm doing great. Glad oh. to be here. Okay, that's good to have you here. Could you kind of let people know exactly where did your life got started at? Uh, well, I was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, and uh, both my parents uh, moved there from North Carolina, and... Uh, I've been there for at least up until I was like uh, 45, and then I moved to Wallingford, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I reside now. Now, what was it like growing up in Waterbury, uh, Connecticut? Uh, Waterbury was uh, very inspirational in my life. My parents, uh, they both worked. My mother was like a nursing home uh, lady that worked around there. My father worked in the in Bridgeport in the foundry. It's like a place called Producto, work with machines and stuff like that. So they were both parents that worked and uh, Waterbury is an industrial area mm -hmm. and um, it was nice, very uh, like Hartford, Main Street, you know, mm -hmm. the, somewhat of the streets, the, you know, the ghetto, yes. as they want to say. That's where we was brought up at. I'm mm -hmm. proud of it. You okay. know. Our grass was glass. Okay. okay. You know what I mean? So it, it was it was good. Well, what was your interest growing up as a child? What type of hobbies did you like to get involved with? I was like everyone else. I wanted to play mm -hmm. outside until I was um, brought up with a uh, gift of uh, playing the piano. And my parents was uh, professional singers. And so it ran through us. And, um, you know, they had a piano on the back porch. And one day they came home and they heard someone playing. And my brothers and sisters was like, Mom, that's Chris playing. But they was like, that can't be because he is too small to reach the pedal mm -hmm. on the piano. So they stuck me up there and I began to play. Um, I think the first song I was started playing was the Boogie Woogie. You know what I mean? Okay. So I played that and they was like, oh my God, the gift. And they um, took me down to the church and they baptized me and I became a you know, uh, inspirational, a prize, a, a gifted person toward God, you know. So, and that's all I remember since I was four, and I've been playing ever since. Now, was the piano the only instrument that you was playing growing up as a child? Well, at that point, and then all the little toys that they had, the little saxophone and the little uh, vibe thing that used to roll around with all the colors, you know. Mm -hmm. I used to play that and stuff like that, but... The more I got into uh, high school, I began to venture off into like tuba. I played the tuba, drums, bass, played the guitar, mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah, but the first was the piano. But uh, which instrument? Which instrument did you love playing the best? The piano. Know, the piano. Yeah, the piano was was the best. Mm -hmm. It's got eighty eight keys. Okay, that's enough keys. Yeah. Now, did you think about pursuing a career in the music industry at that particular age going into high school? No, not really. Um, I was, when you grow up in there, and I, like I said, I was a church player. So being gifted, everyone was like, oh my God, he's gifted and you know, this and that. So you don't, at that point, you don't have your focus point of becoming what you are. You're just kind of living through what you are, people telling you talented and all that, things like that. So mm -hmm. it's up until you got to go through life and stuff like that to evaluate what you want to do with your talents and stuff like that. Because, you know, in growing up, you also have uh, life. You know, you got to go to work, you mm -hmm. got to do things like that. So we didn't know if music was going to be what I was going to make money off or to survive and to take care of a family okay. just by playing a piano. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it comes a little bit more than that, you know. Well, which direction did you pursue after graduating high school? Well, I went into the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, from age four until I was like 18, I was everything was music. Um, I studied with a lady named Miss Baskerville at the age of four. 
she got me into a lady named Miss Grossman, mm -hmm. uh, which got me into the gifted program that Yale was running from age 14 to I was 18. And then after that, I was enrolled with a Heart School of Music with Jackie McLean. Mm -hmm. So after that, when I got about 20 years old, I wanted to do something different because music was all me. I did that from age four to I was like 19 or 20. Okay. I wanted to do something else. So I joined the Marine Corps mm -hmm. after that in 1980. Okay. Yep. Now what was it like being in the Marines? It's great. Mm -hmm. I started training, um, you know, growing up, being a uh, somewhat of a genius, you was like a nerd. So, you know, I wore bow ties and high water pants, <laughs> stuff like that. The Marine Corps changed me. I began to lift weights and became, you know, uh, yeah, like I am today. I became a big guy big and guy. I, didn't, I didn't do any music in the Marine Corps. I never told them I played the piano. Okay. So that was just like more working out. And my MOS, I was a truck driver. So mm. from 1980 to 1983, that's what I did. No music. Okay. Just Marine Corps. So you kind of forgot all about music at that stage of your life. You were so heavily involved in yeah, the I Yeah, I didn't forget about it. It oh. was more of a, I had to put that on the side. You okay. Know? Because one of my drill instructors told me, like, don't you ever think about playing the piano in here. Mm -hmm. You're going to go pick up an M16 okay. and go fight for your country. Right. I was like, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So we'll no, we'll no keyboard playing there. <laughs> Okay, Chris, now what did you do after the Marines, after you got finished your Marines Corps? Well, I came out of the Marines in 1983, and I came back to Waterbury, Connecticut, uh, and I stayed here probably until 1985, and I moved out west with my oldest brother. Mm -hmm. He had asked me to come out and to, you know, to hang out and see what's up, and I told him, I think I want to start my music career back up. So in 1985, I moved out to Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, okay. Now, you say Des Moines, Iowa, people don't think of that as a music town. People, when you, when you say West, I thought instantly you was talking about um, California. So what was it like living out well, there? Well, it was the Midwest. And, the and, yeah, there's nothing out there. That's in the middle of the United States. Right. And that's where all the corn and potatoes <laughs> grow uh -huh. and Big John Deers. Okay. But my brother was out there, and, you know, he, he was like, I think you should just come out here and, you know, uh, get your life together, see what you're going to do with music. They got they had a little music scene. Well, when I got there, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, I met up with uh, a lot of good people in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, this guy named Bob Economaki. He's a big computer wizard, and he was into the MIDI scene. The MIDI scene was the music, like MIDI and keyboards up, so you can get all types of sounds, like horns, a bass drums from a keyboard so mm -hmm. that really intrigued me that I, I wouldn't need a real drummer I don't need a real sax player I can do it all from the keyboard so that really really intrigued me so I was like wow so when he taught me that that was the best thing I started my music production learning music production so I learned all of that in Des Moines Iowa mm -hmm. from, from Bob Economaki so it was incredible so that's kind of telling me you can pretty much learn anywhere throughout the country if you really are gifted and you have the right opportunities. You can learn in Alaska. Alaska, okay. Yeah, you can learn anywhere. It don't matter. And if you know, so a lot of people, we don't know that, but the world is huge and there's a lot of talent everywhere, just not in the metropolitan areas. You know, New York, there's talent everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, South Africa, Egypt, you know what I mean? It's everywhere, so it doesn't matter. It's, it's within you what you want to do. But don't you still need the right studios and the right key people in the business to kind of get you going to make a record deal or to get you, you Yeah, know? back then in the 80s, nowadays, you oh. make records right in your house, in basements. I know uh, Drake, his record, first record, he did it on a tour bus. Okay. You know? All right. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a what you bring inside yourself to the table. To the table. Okay. Yes. Now, at that stage of your life, you was thinking seriously that I can make a career now? But That's when I started, producer? yeah. When I got to Des Moines, Iowa, and I got all of that learning underneath my belt and began to produce, you know, some of the artists out there, mm -hmm. I began to see that, wow, this can, this can be pretty good. And it's what I love to do. So when you can find a job that you love to do mm -hmm. and make an earning, it's very, very nice. Now, now, excuse me, Chris, what actually does a record producer has to do? I mean, give me a, like the criteria of a record a producer. Well, you know, a record producer, as I say, they are, 
the somewhat of the vision of the artist. The artist has a vision and then they, she or he, puts it over into the record producer mm -hmm. to make the record come out. Okay. Um, so whatever the artist seeing the record producer will go yay or nay, or to help them get that record, that song of what the artist is seeing too. Some record producers are arrogant mm -hmm. and they only see it their way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's, it's mostly a collaboration of the artist and the record producer. Mm -hmm. Now, usually you have to be able to play some of the instruments to be... Sometimes, to, sometimes you don't. You like, don't? No, like P. Diddy. I don't know if he do or don't, but he's a great record producer. Uh, Mary J. Blige and Biggie Small mm -hmm. and uh, 112 and all of them. I don't know if he sat down and played those production tracks, but his vision of what he had for those artists is, you know, they are platinum sellers. Mm -hmm. So his vision of that is is incredible and that's marketing that's everything that's just not the the playing it's the marketing it's the whole vision of seeing it's like it's like a corporate okay. a corporate world mm -hmm. sitting down at a table full of you you got the artists you have the record producer you got the executive you got the marketing and the salespeople. that's how a song and a record develops but when you're working on a song you're working directly with the artists direct studio yes okay. Exactly. And, you know, they tell me, well, this is what I'm hearing. This is what I want the song to be. And then, you know, we go about it and to see, you know, some songs are different. Me, personally, where I'm at in my stage now, mm -hmm. every song must have a vision for me. Okay. Every song. Now, you, you know what I mean? That's marketing and the whole nine yards. That's important. Well, Chris, what type of styles of music do you um, produce? I produce, mostly I produce smooth jazz. R&B-ish and uh, gospel, and I also do uh, scoring films too, okay. and commercials. And commercials. Uh, which artist or which record producer has you kind of idolized or looked up to when you was getting started into the business? Uh, one of my favorites is uh, Quincy Jones. Okay. But I have uh, reached out and adapted like uh, Timberland, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dre, extraordinary producers right. for the field that they in, yeah. Very, very, very nice. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, another big name record producers was Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. LA. Forgot about them. How could you forget about them? Yeah. And L.A. and Babyface. L.A. and Babyface. Yes. But they kind of put a certain Midwest sound, like the Minneapolis sound that was yes. real popular back in the 80s. Jimmy Jam and them. And like I was saying before, it was like the power of the synthesizer, what they really adapted into that Minneapolis sound, you know, the poly moog mm -hmm. and all that it was very, very big. And also it has come back in 2013, the synthesizers, very, very big and big records now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like that disco uh, type of sound and stuff like that. Very big now. Well, Chris, do you kind of listen to those producers and try to pick up some of their, you know, talents or some of oh, their? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's like you, you have to study. You got to know, you know, where you at, your sound versus today's sound. You just can't, like, come up with a sound. And you can, but I don't know if it's going to be accepted. But to have, uh, like, marketing type of sounds, what people are listening to today mm -hmm. makes the song even more better to get airplay because it has, like, what you call the sound-alike mm -hmm. type of thing. You know what I mean? So cause I have did some songs that sound like George Duke. I have did some songs that sound like Earth, Wind & Fire. I have did some songs that sound like L.A. and Babyface. I incorporated their sound to mine also. Mm -hmm. Do you like the styles today better than it was in the 80s? Or is it about the same? Was there any difference between the styles now comparable to when you got started? Yeah, there's a difference. And, and me with the dislike or like, mm -hmm. I call it music. It, it changes from the Beatles in the 60s and from all the other things. You know what I mean? It, there's a... It changes, but I really do like the 80s and 90s music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that that's more musical to me. To you, okay. Yes. Oh, okay, well, Chris, I mean, you have a tremendous gift and you have a, a tremendous talent, and I think a record producer is a real key role in the music industry. Would you kind of agree with that? Yes, along with the record company okay. and, and the artist. It's, it's, it's split all the way around. Uh -huh. Yeah, but, but the record producer do have the uh, 
challenge to bring the record to the front and to get it sounding correctly and to present what the artist is feeling on that record. Okay. Well, Chris, we're going to take a quick break. I'm hosting this program this morning, All About You. I'm enjoying my conversation uh, with, a nominee, with a Grammy nominee, record producer, Chris uh, Big Dog Davis. And we will be right back very shortly. Thank you. Pitch your business. Okay. Hi, I'm Paul Willis, host of the Grassroots Business Journal on accesstv.org. We have a segment called Pitch Your Business where small business owners have the opportunity to give a three-minute elevator pitch about their business. If you are a small business owner and need to get the word out about what you offer, then you need to put a face with your business on the Grassroots Business Journal segment, Pitch Your Business. You can contact me, Paul Willis, at 860-490-8856 or email me at pcwillis at gmail.com get worldwide business exposure be seen on the social media links like Facebook or Twitter so pitch your business the place for small business marketing needs Author E. Diane Cook shows children the power of love in her new illustrated book, the second in a series offering young readers fun-filled, exciting stories with life lessons. Follow Keturah Anderson's adventure with a story about loving others and yourself. And discover a town with colorful characters who are judged by what's seen on the outside. The Andersons, Keturah's Bedtime Story, available online at www.amazon.com. Yes, again, this is our Jonathan Small. I'm back here with my guest, Chris Big Dog Davis. He is a Grammy nominee, record producer. And Chris, could you kind of let people know exactly what is it like when you are nominated for a Grammy? It's a, uh, what I want to say, it's a surreal feeling. Mm -hmm. I remember the night, it was the Grammy uh, on TV. They had the Grammy uh, live concert. And... Um, I was producing an artist called Floesis from Floetry, Natalie, and we had a listening section and um, I went to sleep on the couch afterwards and all of a sudden my phone was going off like 60 times buzzing and there was people congratulating me like, yo, I just heard your name mm -hmm. on, on, on the uh, Grammy live concert, uh, you and Mace has been nominated for a Grammy. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. I didn't believe it, so I woke up and I seen it, and I seen uh, our name in the category for best traditional R&B performance come up. Like so, uh, it was surreal, man. It's, mm -hmm. It was real interesting to really capture that feel. What you feel, it's hard to say, you mm -hmm. know, really. But I was impressed and happy. Mm -hmm. Now, what particular year time frame was that Grammy um, nominee that you was recently? That nominated? was in 2013. 2000, okay. Mm -hmm. This year. <laughs> this yep. year, all right. Yeah, absolutely. Because actually, you just came out from the Grammys in yes. uh, um, L.A. Yeah, I, I snuck through there. I was uh, The day before, I was in Asheville, North Carolina with Gerald Albright, who was also nominated for Best Pop Instrumental mm -hmm. for Smooth Jazz. And uh, we uh, went out there together and... Uh, yeah, it was good. We both lost, so we kind of laughed at each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thought that was funny. But isn't it still somewhat of a victorious uh, oh, effort yeah. once you are nominated yeah, for a Grammy? Yeah, because that's what you keep calling me. <laughs> right, okay. Grammy nominee. Grammy nominee. That's, yeah. that's the way it's going to go down in history until I win one. Then it will be Grammy Award winning producer. Uh -huh. So, yes. Now, Chris, how long technically has you actually been a record producer? It's been about 13 years now, so mm -hmm. I'm still a little, they call it a little green, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but my uh, first big artist that I produced was Phil Perry, and that was from the Rhythm of Love tour. And on that tour was Will Downing, Gerald Albright, Vesta Williams, God bless her soul, yes. she passed, and uh, Phil Perry. Mm -hmm. And Phil Perry was the first artist out of that that took me underneath his wings and said, you're gonna produce me, and he stuck to his word. And from there, it's just been like a fireball going mm -hmm. through. So I don't produce 
everyone from the Rhythm of Love tour and yeah. so many others, you know. Uh, so it's been incredible. Now, then you also work with Brian McKnight. Brian McKnight before that. I was with Brian McKnight from 1995 to like 2000. Mm -hmm. and that was the Anytime tour. And that was, that was like my first big tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call from another Connecticut extraordinary musician was Ron Lawrence. Ron Lawrence was uh, MD in that at that point in time, the first tour. And he called me and said, Brian McKnight, uh, manager's going to call you. And at that point, you go, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But it happened. He called, and we did tour. And when Ron, uh, I think Ron went with Boney James the next year, and then I became uh, the musical director. So mm -hmm. it was great. Now, it sounds like to me you have to actually be on the road traveling a lot when you're into this business. Yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. so people can get to know who you are. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very important because if they don't know you and you're just sitting at home mm -hmm. and you're saying you're a great producer, um, yeah, you need to get out. And I was fortunate that uh, I got to tour with a lot of uh, artists that I have produced. Mm -hmm. So that's how that worked together. But I've been off the road for eight years now, just absolutely producing. And recently, in the last couple months, I've been back on with Gerald Albright because I'm about to produce his record this year. In February, he will be here in Connecticut, and I'll be producing his record. So. And that kind of leads me into, you have your own recording studio in your home? Yes, I, okay. I, I built it up in there to, uh, because now, nowadays, Jonathan, there's not like a lot of hit factories in New York where they spend a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. Every, the overhead is very low now, and you can, you know, young kids and upcoming people that do beats, they do it right in their basement, in their parents' house, whatever, mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Making it work, yes. So, it's a good thing. <laughs> Overhead is low, too. Overhead is low. Yes, okay. very low. So yeah. actually, excuse me, you have the artists come directly into your home? They and fly they... into Bradley Airport, uh, have a car service pick them up, uh -huh. and they come to the house, man. And it's nice. Every, you, you know, it's, it's a different feel. It's not so much uh, corporate, you know, in the studio and this and that. It's like home, man. We take our shoes off and we go do work. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. Very now, nice. Now, Chris, when you are producing a song for an artist, how long does it usually take? I mean, you're working on an album process, so what's the time frame that you're yeah, talking it, about? Yeah, it, it depends on, like, sometimes I may get to do three or four songs on a record, and then they have another producer that do two or three songs and stuff like that. Um, it depends. Like I said, mostly, Jonathan, it's called the vision of what you see of the song. Mm -hmm. That's where I mostly lie at, the vision. So sometimes it may take a day or so, and sometimes it may take a week, mm -hmm. as long as that vision is correct. Where are we going with this song? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's, that's the most important thing with me, you know? Where are we going with it? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing about a record producer, because I remember when Janet Jackson had a Control album done in 1986, yes. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis insisted that she had to come out to Minneapolis. Exactly. To feel them, to feel what they had to offer. Uh -huh. And, you know, and, and before, on that album, even before they start making, doing any music, they sat down for days and weeks just talking. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. It's the vision. You know what I mean? You, right. you just can't put on an artist, like, you know, like Dr. Dre and them, when Dr. Dre met Eminem, mm -hmm. they, had, they went and sat down and they studied each other. Right. What both can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, I do this beat, you rap like this, we collaborate. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that, that's the whole big thing about it, is vision and the collaboration between the artist and the producer. Mm -hmm. It sounds like to me, I don't know if this fits into people that you have worked with, but I know at one point Janet Jackson, when she was getting started, her career really wasn't booming. And also, Bobby Brown had some issues with his first album. Right. But once the two of them got hooked up, particularly Janet Jackson with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and Bobby Brown with Ali Reid and Babyface, then the next thing you know, their album just skyrocketed in, in sales. Right. B because of the collaboration, they both knew mm -hmm. where they wanted to go with the songs. You know what I mean? That, that, that whole thing like with Bobby Brown, what was that song? Um, not the prerogative, but the other one. Don't be cruel? Yeah. Okay. You know, just Babyface looking at 
the words don't mm -hmm. be cruel. Mm -hmm. You know, now we can take something like that and it would be, but well, what are they saying? But you see how he put it? Mm -hmm. Don't be cruel. I will never be that way to you. So it, it made it almost like a love song. Right. You know what I mean? With the groove on top of it. And then Bobby Brown image. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So and just the same thing with Janet Jackson, with the Rhythm of Nation. Everything was like rhythmic. It was hardcore. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? With her dancing. So as a producer, they really zero in on that. From the beats, from what the songs, you know what I mean? And look what Rhythm Nation did, the hits that that had. Mm -hmm. you know, amazing. Well, I'm just saying that because there might be an artist that you work with that might be trying to get their career getting started and then might be having some issues really with on record sales and right. things and, on that and level. It basically boils down is to a song and the marketing point of the song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But like now and today, that we don't have like radio play like we used to have back in the day. So now it's more like uh, internet. You know, they got internet radio. So that's why I said... More of the things I do today is more vision. You got to have vision. It's the whole package. It's not the song. It's not how beautiful or how sexy one is. It's the whole package. It's mm -hmm. got to be song. Mm -hmm. It's got to be marketing, sales, the title of the song, and some controversy, actually, oh. sales. Okay. Ask Justin Bieber about that. All right, I will okay. <laughs> if I get a chance. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell me something, Chris. Why did you decide, because a lot of big name people in the entertainment business usually likes to be in New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta, other key cities throughout the country. Why did you decide to stay in Connecticut and stay in uh, Wallingford? I, I, I love Connecticut. I okay. love Connecticut. This is where I'm from. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're home. You okay. know what I mean? And... Through internet, everybody will know who you are. You just that's what I'm saying. Sometimes mm -hmm. you don't even have to move now. Mm -hmm. And they're coming here. Okay. So we must be doing something right because they're coming to Connecticut, man. Right. I mean, George Clinton, Ken Burrell, mm -hmm. Najee, Mesa, Phil Perry. Mm -hmm. They're all coming here. Okay. You know, so we're doing something correct. So it's kind of like, you know, maybe Connecticut is a new uh, level where we can kind of put our state on the map in the entertainment business. Well, it, it, one thing with me, if there's one thing I can do is from a music point of view mm -hmm. is to show that, that we have talent here, uh, we're educated, we know what is happening, mm -hmm. you know, we have a lot of talent here. And this is another thing, you know, pretty soon I'm going to be venturing out looking for talent, you know, okay. looking to enhance Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Because everyone got talent. But it's more of the understanding what to do with the talent, how to go about it. People get on American Idol, they get on The Voice, and they up there 15 minutes of fame, and then that's it, it drops. Mm -hmm. That's when it needs to drop right in my hand, and mm -hmm. I can take them up to the next level. Because they've been there. Now you need to see the business part of it and how to sustain. And maybe you want to do this for the rest of your life, you know, mm -hmm. singing and entertaining people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you still love what you're doing and you're still passionate about your a career choice that you have made? Every day, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. I pray every day and I thank God mm -hmm. that I can wake up and sit in my pajamas and work. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. It's kind of like my executive on producer here at Access on TV. Um, same dog. You same thing he's doing. Who Mr. Stan? Same thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can't beat that feeling. Can't beat that, brother. And going to the mailbox, you cannot beat it. Uh -huh. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so 2014 is just getting started. What's your plans really for this particular year that you have? Well, up? the uh, Grammys is over. We didn't win, but the accolades and the things that is coming from that is so much um uh i got so many like uh, speeches to go do and people wanting to hear from me about how is the grammy what does it feel like and you know going around to speak in schools and help the kids mm -hmm. you know in the public schools give them drives we need drives for the young kids they need something they don't took music out of schools so they have nothing to help them you know it's just mostly sports mm -hmm. but we need music music's is, is a beautiful thing. It does so much to our insides. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that, and I, like I said, I have Gerald Albright. I'm producing his record in February. I did a record, The Flow Assist from Flow Tree, is coming out this year. Bad record, man. It's mm -hmm. like incredible record. 
and then I'm doing a little touring. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go out and play a little more, and you know, hopefully, I got some people in my uh, forecast that I want to produce, like. Uh, Oh, what's his name? Dave Cos. Mm -hmm. I got some Dave Cos in my view. You know, that's that smooth jazz thing. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to start working with some like uh, gospel choirs around here. I, I love gospel, so mm -hmm. I'm going to venture off into that type of thing too. Yes. Uh, I know you mentioned a lot about the hip hop. Do you kind of like the gospel hip hop of the Kurt Franklins or Mary Marys? Do you think that's a new style that's kind of promoted? Yes, I, I love that, I love I, and that. I, I love the old one too. Uh -huh. You'll never hear me say, oh, I don't like that, it, because it's all acceptable. It, like I said, it depends on the marketing uh -huh. and the corporate of it all. That's where I lie at. If it, if it can be marketable, it's it. And Kirk Franklin's been doing great with that, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. and, and, and it's usually everybody is talking and singing yeah. now with the hip hop beat behind it, you know. But yeah. it's all love, they call it praise and worship. So I'm, I'm into all that. Oh, okay. I'm I in. know you mentioned that you started it with gospel. I started with gospel, yeah. And, uh -huh. and like I said, um, I did uh, produce Kim Burrell, uh, I think that was like six years ago, uh -huh. and that was fun. And I haven't did a gospel record out, but I also been working with uh, my boys from New Haven called Soul Temple. Okay. They was on The Preacher's Wife. And uh, we got a couple new records going to come out this year. So that that's gospel, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So yeah, absolutely. Well, Chris, you really work with some big artists that you just oh, been, I'm, uh, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate, man. You uh -huh. know what I mean? And just being on that drive, and that's why I want to tell people you you can really go do it. Go mm -hmm. go do it like Nike. Mm -hmm. Just do it. It can be done. You can live your dream. You can do it. But Chris, just kind of warn people, because the reputation that the music industry can be a very cutthroat business. And it is. Okay. It, yeah, it, it is. I call it the Wall Street. Wow. And it is. But you, you know, just like anything, any job can be cutthroat. But mm. you, you got to have your drive within you. It first comes from you. Mm. And if you have that inside of you, you can beat all odds. Mm -hmm. all, all the odds don't matter. It's cutthroat. Mm -hmm. They knock you down, you get back up. Okay. And you work. I've been knocked down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't have royalties taken from me, okay. which people don't understand the business. I get it now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because that's how we live. I, I live off the songs I write. Okay. That's the royalties. That's the business of it. Some people give up royalties, you know, so... Okay. Well, Chris, I had enjoyed this interview here this morning. Is there any other last things or last words that you would like for people out there to know about Chris Big Dog Davis? Yeah, that um, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Live your dream. It's possible. Okay. Well, I had enjoyed having you on this morning as my guest, and I think you are very, very emerging artist that people need to clearly be aware of. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Again, this is Jonathan Small. I am the host and producer of All About You. I enjoy doing this program um, this morning. This program, again, can be seen on accesstv.org network, and we're just going to continue to grow for the new year of 2014. And as I say every week to people out there, have a very blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you. <laughs>